Hi, I'm Brittany from Slanted Spines, and today I'm going to be doing a book review on The Night Watchman by Louise Erdrich. So at the beginning of 2020, I made a list of books that I was going to review this year. I picked a book for every month, and so far I've only been writing book reviews and posting them on my website, but now that I have a YouTube channel, I'm doing some YouTube videos about them as well. If you'd like to read my book review written rather than on a video, you can visit my website slantedspines.com. That one might be a little more in detail than this one is. I'm much more eloquent when I'm typing rather than speaking in front of a camera, so if I miss anything, I can always insert it into my written book review. Whereas, if I leave something out in this video, you'll just never know you missed it. This book review will be for people who haven't read the book up until a certain point where I'll let you know, and then the second half I'll talk about things that will probably spoil the book for you if you haven't read it yet. So The Night Watchman is about a, a turtle, the Turtle Mountain band of Chippewa Native Americans in North Dakota in the 1950s. It is primarily about two characters. The first one is Thomas. He is an older established man in this community. He has a family. He works as a night watchman at the jeweler jewel bearing plant near the reservation. His name means muskrat, so he's sort of like the lowly muskrat, and he's the guy that everybody goes to in the community when they need help or advice. One day he catches wind of this bill that's headed to Congress that threatens to emancipate the reservations, which is just like a government word for terminate. So this bill potentially will reclaim the land that was designated for the um, not just their Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, but like several reservations. And so if they take the land back, the Native Americans will be without a home. And as many of them in the community are poor, they don't have electricity or plumbing. And oftentimes they don't even really live in real houses. Uh, they cannot afford to be kicked out into the city where they will surely suffer. Then there's Patrice. She is a fresh graduate from high school and a young woman working at the jewel bearing plant. Uh, she works during the day though. She lives with her mom and her younger brother. Her father is an alcoholic and comes and goes. He usually comes back for money. Her older sister, however, is missing. Vera had left to go to Minneapolis, I believe, with her husband. They haven't heard from her for months. It's rumored that she has a baby, so there's a little bit of urgency to find her and make sure she's okay. That's basically the premise of the story, is that the whole community is more or less threatened by this bill that's going to Congress, and Patrice is trying to find her sister. There's many other characters in this book, not just the two of them, and I think because there are so many characters in this book, um, a manageable amount, not too many, but because there are so many characters in this book, it really makes it feel alive. Um, I loved it! My review is that it is a very enjoyable book to read. I have never read anything by Louise Erdrich before, but I will definitely in the future. I also don't really reread books very often, but I would reread this one. I think that I could gain something from going back through it, you know, maybe a little bit slower. I love the writing. I think that's one of the strong suits of this book is the way that she blurs the line between hard to find reality and sort of the more spiritual spirituality of nature. Here's a little excerpt to kind of illustrate the writing style I'm talking about. This is on page 439. Patrice leaned to one side and put her ear to the trunk of a birch tree. She could hear the humming rush of the tree drinking from the earth. She closed her eyes, went through the bark like water, and was sucked up off the bud tips into a cloud. She looked down at herself and her mother, sitting by a small fire in the spring woods. Jeanne tipped her head back and smiled. She gestured at her daughter to come back the way she had when as a child Patrice strayed. So in that scene, Patrice is sitting there with her mother drinking water by a tree, but to Patrice, her experience is that she sort of become one, becomes one with her surroundings and all of a sudden she's 
drinking the water as the tree is and traveling up to the top of the tree and then um, condensating into the cloud and in this sort of surreal beautiful moment even her mother is a part of this experience and is like come back be with me I just thought it was really beautiful I love how the Chippewa view life and the land and spirits and how they consider their ancestors, they live off the land, they just have a general respect and sort of calmness about them. So the writing was amazing. The characters are very... I love the characters in this book. Jana, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but that's Patrice's mother's name. Um, she was one of the most interesting characters to me because she was one of those really really cool older ladies that just knows a whole bunch. She's very wise. And the plot was really good too. I don't think it dragged that much. I have a pretty good tolerance for books, so if other people think a book is boring, sometimes I don't think it's boring just because I'm used to trudging through this stuff. The only thing about this book is not perfect. You know, no book is perfect, but the ending seemed a little underdeveloped, um, almost as if she was trying to wrap everything up kind of quick rather than take her time and really spend some quality description on certain important moments. But also I don't really know what her intention was when she wrote it. Maybe to her it fit with her vision of the story to wrap it up a little bit quickly or not spend too much time um, going over how everything flushed out. It was a good ending, definitely, and it's not like you're like, what the heck? How, how did that happen? Um, it was it's, it's very reasonable and not altogether not too surprising. If you're reading it, you kind of know how it's going to end up. It's a book that I definitely recommend for the enjoyment of reading it. What do you guys think of the cover though? I didn't really think anything of it. I love these colors and when I first got it, I was like, cool colors, but I never really thought anything of it either way until I watched a YouTube book review about this book a couple days ago and one of the first comments was oh it was a great book even though the cover was so hideous and I thought about it I was like I guess it is kind of an ugly cover I mean it's not inherently ugly but I think if you know the story you know that there's so much artistic potential for the cover there was a book I read when I was younger, I think it was called Touching Spirit Bear. That one is a really good book. That had a really cool cover. It had like a, I think a large bear looming over like a young man. And I think that this cover may have had some cool potential, especially given the way that um, she writes the story where it's like one with the characters are often one with nature or having these spiritual experiences. So yeah, I see their point, but also it didn't really matter to me because when I read this, <laughs> I took the dust jacket off, so it was just a blue book for me. Purple? There is one particular quote I want to discuss a little bit in detail. It's one that I break down in my book review as well. If you haven't read this and you don't want to know what happens, you should stop the video, like it, and then come back to this when you've read the book. You can also watch this part if you have no intention of reading the book whatsoever and you just want to hear about it. On page 214, Barnes visits Thomas after dropping off his kids from boxing practice, I believe, and um, Barnes, having a crush on Patrice, is moping over her yet again. He says, if I married an Indian woman, would that make me an Indian? Could I join? Could I join the tribe? And then Erdrich writes, Not for the first time, Thomas felt sorry for a white fellow. There was something about some of them, their sudden thought that to become an Indian might help. Help with what? Thomas wanted to be generous, but also he resisted the idea that his endless work, the warmth of his family, and this identity that got him followed in stores and ejected from restaurants and movies, this way he was, for good or bad, was just another thing for a white man to acquire. No, he said gently, you could not be an Indian, but we could like you anyway. I thought that part was really interesting. Um, let's talk about Barnes for a second. He has a crush on Patrice, um, but every time he thinks about her, he thinks about how beautiful she is. He thinks about how much he wants her to love him. 
And as you start to break down his infatuation with her, you realize, does he know anything about her? Really, does he even think about her personality, about what she wants, about what she is going through? It sort of comes off like he is just trying to acquire her because she is this Indian beauty that he is absolutely intrigued with. So there's that. On Thomas's side of it, he is not trying to be malicious or vengeful when he tells Barnes that he could never be an Indian. Thomas's thoughts are informed by history. When white people came to America, they took the land that was here because they wanted to. They saw it and they wanted it, so they took it. And Thomas sees this, and when Barnes asks him if he can become this, Thomas thinks, no, you can't just have it because you want it. You know, white people are always trying to acquire things or take things. There's a certain mentality of entitlement bred into white people just through history, and it's automatic that if a white person wants something, they can find a way to get it or justify getting it through whatever immoral ways that they do. And it's clear that Barnes' intention isn't that he genuinely wants to become an Indian because he understands the Chippewa people, he's lived among them, studied their culture. He is only interested in becoming a member of the Chippewa Turtle Mountain Band of Indians because he wants to marry Patrice. Those intentions aren't right. And he doesn't get to just decide he's an Indian because there's so much more that goes along with it than just deciding or marrying into it or using the name of it. Thomas doesn't really take the time to explain that. He doesn't have to explain anything to him. But you can see Thomas's loving heart in that he does want to have this dialogue with Barnes. He wants to he doesn't want Barnes to stop trying to listen to them and spend time with them, but he wants him to understand that there is something there that, you know, Barnes just can't have, you know, he's not entitled to, despite his upbringing probably in the cities with lots of privilege and luxuries, he can never understand the sort of trials and sacrifices they've had to make just being who they are. I appreciate that Barnes and Thomas and a lot of the people in this community have dialogues about things. So even when someone is somewhat ignorant about what they're talking about, like when the Mormons come and there's just this total blockade of understanding between their two different religions, the Chippewa spirituality and the Mormonism. They never get angry though, they never yell at each other or accuse each other. They always kindly and calmly explain things. You know, just knowing when and where to give their energy and, and their words to. I think that's something that this book accomplishes, is just offering so many perspectives about Native Americans and racism and just the history of white people taking things in this country. The senator, Arthur Watkins, who is who has started this bill, he just wants the land back, so he found a way to do it through using the government. It's totally legal, and yet it's totally inhumane. I think that's the value of reading books, is that you get to hear other people's perspectives. You get to learn about people that you never would have met in real life if you live in a certain area, and understand them better, and understand what they love and what they think about, and how similar they are to us, but also understand their plights and their suffering and why they're so frustrated sometimes. And I think more now more than ever we need to be listening to each other and just understanding and just talking, you know, sharing our sides of the story in a calm, meaningful way. There are several issues that this book touches on. Um, there's human trafficking in it, which was absolutely horrifying to read about. Thankfully those scenes were really short, like how Vera was... Ugh, I can't even talk about Vera. It just breaks my heart what she went through. Just a lot of a lot of topics covered in this book, and not in a heavy way, but it did bring up a lot of good questions, and there were a lot of parts I underlined because I was like, this is a good point, or this is a poignant observation. Karma! She has been snuggling me all day. Um, there's a 
lot else to say about this book, but I don't want to make this video like 20 minutes long. I will say I gave it 5 stars on Goodreads, but that's not surprising because I frequently do that. It is so hard for me to review books and rate books because the reading experience is so subjective. Um, I often have my writer side and my reader side clashing about certain things, but at the end of the day, the reader experience is all that matters. If I enjoy reading a book, even if it wasn't perfect, I'm still gonna say it's good because if I read it and I gained something from it or I felt excitement or any sort of emotion or movement or saw a different perspective or just got another taste of something, I can- I find I can like most books. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who's already liked, subscribed, commented, or shared my videos. I appreciate their support so much. It's kind of crazy right now in the world, so I appreciate you taking the time to watch this and hear my thoughts about a book. If you want to read my book for next month, check out In a Dark Dark Wood by Ruth Ware. I'll be writing a book review and probably making a book review video about that one too. This one seems like it's going to be like a thriller or a horror, so a little bit different genre for me. I don't normally read these. So yeah, grab a copy of this and then you can join along for next month.